You know, the first time I got that, that real deep glimpse of myself and who I was, now I realize like, holy crap, well, now I get to look at this person in the mirror every day right. and say, am I proud of this person? Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm so glad to have you here today, as I am with every episode. And I'm fulfilling my promise to you to bring you amazing success stories today with another guest. I've got Clifford Starks on the show with me. Clifford, or I'm going to call you Cliff because it's just easier for me to say, and you said it was okay. So, Cliff, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, Mike. So let me tell you a little bit about Cliff and... Um, and why he's here. You'll, you'll understand why he's here when I tell you this. So, so Clifford is, there I go, I called you Clifford. So Cliff is a transformational coach, a personal trainer, and a former professional mixed martial arts fighter. He just retired recently from that after you know, a long career and, and a very successful career as well. Congratulations on that. He's used to competing against some of the fiercest competitors on the planet, I watched a video today, folks, and that is true. It is fierce. Uh, and he's realized that it's uh, always about more than just transforming the body. The mind and spirit play key factors in everyone's success. Cliff coaches C-level executives and entrepreneurs who need clarity and applied knowledge to achieve their biggest goals. His Power of Six leadership development program helps his clients achieve optimal performance on command. I love that on command, Cliff. He believes, as I do, that to grow as a person and a leader, it's as simple as making the decision to never stop. And so with that, Cliff, let's get going. I start every show with the same question, and that is, how did it happen for you? Yeah. So I learned to be a fighter very early on my journey. Uh, the fight's never over. You know, you're always learning your fight. And when I was four, my my biological dad drove away. And I remember him driving away. And I remember that feeling that I had from him driving away. You know, knowing that the people who are supposed to be there for you can just leave. <laughs> and so you have to figure things out on your own and go through your process on your own, or at least in that particular area. Uh, then when I was five, uh, my grandfather, there was something wrong with him and I didn't know what it was exactly. And I remember them taking me to the hospital, my parents. Uh, and I say my parents because my, my mom remarried, but I'll get into that in a second. Okay. But I'm in the hospital. I remember my uncle carrying me out of the hospital. Like, and I didn't know what was going on exactly. And so fast forward, I see my, my grandfather in a coffin and it just scared the crap out of me. Like I was so afraid of that moment, knowing like one day I'm going to die. You know, it just, it, it really shook me. And then when I was six, that is when my mom actually married the man that I call dad to this day. You know, he's a man of, uh, solid, solid character, integrity, and, and solid, solid values. And he has, he has helped me so far on my journey, helped me understand more of me. And honestly, I think I help him understand more of him too, because the process isn't just a one way street as I as I continue to learn. But so from four, five and six, it was there's going to be people in your life who are supposed to be there and they're going to leave. It's just part of the journey. Uh, life's a fight. It's scary. And you're going to have scary moments. And you get to see like how you're going to show up to those scary moments. And you can either get busy living as much life as possible, or you can die an early death and just be afraid and scared and terrified and, and play a small game. Uh, that's what my grandfather taught me. And at six, it was just because people who are supposed to quote unquote supposed to be there can leave people who don't have to be there can stay you know they can stay and they can show up for you in some of the highest most profound ways and so i've taken 
taken my journey and said, I'm going to experience as much as I can. I'm going to squeeze as much as I can out of life and learn as many lessons along the way as I possibly can. And I'm just going to fight my way into whatever successes there may be on the journey. And when you, when your dad, your biological dad left, do you remember, was there, did he talk to you before he left or were, was it just sort of this thing out of the blue? And I know memories can be a little fuzzy when, when you're four, but. So to be completely honest, when we're, when I, when I was this young, I only remember two specific scenarios with him and both not so good. <laughs> so I, I remember him driving away because in my head, I kind of knew he wasn't going to come back. I don't even remember having any kind of discussion of him saying he was going to do it. I just remember the drive away. And I also remember there was this Ghostbuster ride I wanted to get on. And I was so afraid because of the ghosts that would be in the Ghostbuster ride. Um, I asked him if he would get on the ride with me and he didn't get on the ride with me. And so I was just kind of like, those were the two scenarios that I specifically remember from that stage of my life at that okay. age. And the, um, the, the, the scene with your grandfather, which is very poignant the way you, you told that, I was, it, I was thinking to myself that if I was five and I saw like a coffin, I wouldn't be sure what it meant. Like I wouldn't be 100% sure what it meant. And you said it scared, it really scared you when you saw that. So I had you, I guess, how did you, I know I'm asking a question when you're five years old. It's a very tough question to ask. And I'm just wondering how you think about how you put that together. Yeah, so I was absolutely terrified to the point, you know how they say fight or flight? Sure. And I, I just went into freeze. I was frozen from the whole experience. And I, I felt very stuck knowing that reality, knowing like my existence doesn't go on forever, like I'm gonna die. And so I didn't know it was something I was doing at the time. I, I really coached myself through that process and said, all right, if I'm gonna die, um, I better live. You know, I gotta go through, like, if I know this new reality, I better do the things that I can do while I am here. Got it. And was the was your grandfather your father's father or your mother's father? My mother's father. Your mother's father. Okay. So at six, um, your your dad, your your uh, new dad at the time, and and your present dad comes into your life and how and 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 has this amazing impact on you. Like, mm -hmm. he, he, that had to be, I, I think that, I would think that it would have to be very surprising because it's gotta be scary to have, I haven't had that happen in my life, so I don't know, but I think it's gotta be scary to have someone new come in, particularly after someone, you know, after your, your real dad, it's kind of fresh in your mind that, you know, he drove away and just left you and your mom and maybe other siblings that you have, I don't know. Uh, just me at the time, okay. but I do have some siblings from, from those two, my, my, I, I guess the best thing I could call him is my real dad. I don't mean any disrespect yeah. to my biological, but a, a dad is more than just a title to me. Um, but I will say it was very weird and I did have trust issues. And I was just, I didn't even want to call him dad. I didn't, and I didn't for a while. And I, I was never a mean, cruel person, mm -hmm. but I knew what I wanted and I knew what I didn't want. And I knew that, okay, if people can just leave, you might as well get, 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 get busy getting very, very strong and also focus directly on doing the best that you can for you taking things internally, because externally, the world doesn't show up, at least at the, that time. That's yeah. where my thought process yeah. was. And did you think, so uh, yeah, so I was thinking, as you were telling that, uh, okay, 
Uh, so a new person comes into my life and I know people can leave. So I'm going to test it. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to push some buttons here and see if this person is really committed to me and my family or, or it's going to be another one of those, you know, things, situations that turns out like the people who are supposed to be there don't have to be there <laughs> you, as you discover. Yeah. Um, hmm. So what, where'd you go from there? I mean, so you're six, you've got, you, you know, your, your grandfather's gone, your dad is gone, left. You have a new, you have a new person in your life who's becomes dad, which is fan, phenomenal. And then where do you go? So it was interesting. Uh, this happened when I was a teenager, actually. I was looking in the mirror and we were, we were at a hotel. So this is why it even happened. But I'm looking in the mirror and you know where there's a mirror in the front of you and there's a mirror in the back of you? Sure, yeah. So I could see my love handles oh, on the back. Okay. And it just, I got a real clear look at myself. <laughs> I'm just sitting there staring like, oh my God, I am fat. Like that was what went through my head and I'm not trying to fat shame or hate on anybody. That's what went through my head for me. I didn't like what I saw. And from there, I was like, now that I see this, I need to change it. And so that was my my big journey on the the weight loss journey, focusing on getting my weight right and in place. Okay, and that was a that was something that you sort of dawned on you as a result of seeing that. It wasn't something that that it was probably something you were thinking about, right? Before, and then you look and you say, because like me, I got a hat on here, but you got you got kind of a haircut like I do. You know, it's, I, I say it's a short haircut, but really the fact is there's not that much hair. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, it's funny because when I look in the mirror, it I feel it and I feel it, it feels like I have hair. But then if I get it, no, see something from behind or a photo, it's like, oh, dude, you don't have any hair. So it's, I, was it kind of like that where you were sort of like, oh, yeah, maybe I'm just, you know, big boned. So whatever. it was funny. Like, <laughs> I didn't take a lot of pictures. Okay. So deep down inside, you know. Yeah. But you just don't look. Like, you're just like, okay, if I don't look, it'll be okay. Yeah. You just yeah, won't yeah. look in that direction. So when I actually looked at myself and I'm like, well, uh, now I see it, so I got to do something <laughs> you can't about run it. Anymore, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and that's where um, I always knew, but I never really addressed it. Yeah, okay. I was just like, if I just keep looking away, I don't look at my stomach, I don't look at pictures, I got this. Yeah. So that's what happened. <laughs> okay. And how did you how did you begin to address it? What was that journey like? Oh, uh, I was done. You know, right when I saw it, it was like, F this, I'm not going to look like this, and I'm going to change it. And I'll tell you, you know, it always starts off way easier in the beginning than when you're in the middle of it. But the cool thing is when you when you get to the end and you actually get the result, the middle doesn't even seem that bad anymore, which is pretty nice. Okay, and in other words, the middle is where all the work actually. Yeah, happens. that's that's okay. where the learning happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All right, cool. And how much, so so you slim down, you bulk up, whatever you did, maybe a combination of things. And mm -hmm. what, what was, was your, your life, life like, like, you know, I guess athletically and stuff prior to this um, epiphany or uh, mirror awakening, I guess. Uh, and, 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 and where did it go from there? As I didn't have an athletic life before then. Okay. Yeah, I actually, I lost the weight first and I got interested in athletics because of the way I felt when I would actually train. Ah, uh, okay. And what, what was your training like? I mean, what were you? I mean, so I was doing uh, push-ups and sit-ups and changed my eating like that was all I did I focused on doing push-ups sit-ups oh wait no and I, there was a lot of jogging too so I was okay, jogging uh, push-ups sit-ups and cleaning my eating up I will tell you they're very good at marketing to us about how healthy everything is but then when you start reading the ingredients yeah. and you realize real quick uh yeah they they're great with the marketing that's for sure 
Yeah, it's uh, I've cut a lot of well, uh, cut a lot of maybe as much sugar out of my diet as as I as I can, and um, it is amazing when you turn that box or whatever around, and you look at it and you see, and it, it, things that are, you know, it says healthy on the front of the box and on the back of the box. It's either you can't read the ingredients or sugar or cane sugar or whatever is the first ingredient. So it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah, so I get your point there. So when did you become, so you started as, a, well, I'll let you tell it, but I know you got, became a wrestler and you got, you, you became quite, you, you became a, a very diverse athlete. Uh, yeah, soon, yeah. Soon so thereafter. Yeah, I got into a lot of athletics and, uh, Cool enough, I actually got inducted into the Hall of Fame of my high school, but I got into wrestling, into track and field, into football, and I went through, it's interesting, uh, they talk about going through the process, you know, getting through the process, and I tell people the first process is always the hardest process. The first one you go through is the hardest, but after you go through one, you can go through many. So you just have to focus on the one and then you get an idea of how to how to conduct this process, how to move in the direction that you want to move into. And I, I feel my weight loss journey really helped with my athletic journey and my educational journey, hmm. to be honest, because the process is always the same. It's all about putting in the reps and putting in the reps in the right areas to get the thing that you want. And so I loved winning. Like winning was really, really fun. I'm super competitive and I would like to say I'm competitive in a healthy way. You know, I enjoy the process. I enjoy the journey and I enjoy the person I become when I compete because it's good to compete and be on top when you're winning, but it's also good to compete and be on top when you're losing. It's very important to know like win, lose, or draw. You have to know you put in your best effort and that you continue to learn through the process so that you can get better and stretch into something even more. So let me ask you a little bit more about the process. You said the first process is the hardest, and I wonder if you could tell us, tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. Yeah, so I actually take the people through, it's called the power of six, mm -hmm. and it's the six principles that have shown up for me consistently, and it shows up for everyone that I coach now, I didn't know I was doing that going forward. I really understood it going backwards. Um, the reason I understood it going backwards was I, I had a speaking coach, so I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So yeah. bear with me, everyone. You can go wherever you um, want. Yeah, so I, was, uh, I had a speaking coach, and this was after my fighting career. This was after um, that process. And the speaking coach wanted me to share my story and and share what steps people could take and actions people could take to move forward on their journey and my first speech was a bomb like it was terrible <laughs> just like it was all over the place um i wanted people to feel good i wanted people to know the greatness in within them and i did it just wasn't clicking in the way that it needed to click like the audience didn't know where to go because I was kind of taking them all over the place. And how old were you when this, when you, what you're describing? Um, I was 37. Okay, yeah, so I was 37 is, when I much, did. You went much forward. Okay. okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Big okay. time. Yeah. So when I sat down, um, because again, the competitor in me always wants to do the best. Sometimes you just have to take some sort of action to see where you're at. And so I took that action. I spoke on the stage. And I go, okay, let me reverse engineer this. Let me go, what's the final result a person gets and what steps do I take them through to get that result? And so I started writing down my whole process and I put it together. I'm like, that's it. That's what they go through to get to, to, get to their promised land, to get to their great version of them. Okay, so the, so, figuring out how to give a good talk really backed you into this power of six is what you're saying. Yeah. Is that, is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. And <laughs> so when you, let me, I, I'm always fascinated with speaking, so I want to ask you a couple questions about it. When you, 
first wanted to do it. You said you were, you said it, you know, maybe it wasn't the greatest, but how did you feel? Were you one of those people who were like, I'm, you know, scared of public speaking or were you a person who's like, yeah, I'm ready to do it, but then didn't have, you know, your process built for it or, or what, what were you like? I was ready to go. You like were, I was okay. nervous as heck because I was speaking in front of friends and family and I actually have, I've always had a, a little bit of a challenge of speaking in front of friends and family and, and even performing in front of, front of friends and family. Uh, and it's something that I'm overcoming because I'm realizing how important that is on my journey, which is super interesting. But uh, yeah, I was nervous, but it was a good nervous. Okay. The same thing when you step inside of a cage for a fight, the same thing when you're in an arena, the same thing when you're doing something that you're not used to doing. The same thing as being a kid who's looking to lose some weight. You go through your process. Okay. And when you um, sort of in the weeds here about, you know, speech, but when you put us, when you put a talk together, do you, what's the technique that you use to remember it? Do you use the rooms in the house as you walk through it? Or do you use some other type of, of way to, 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 you know, to guide you through it without your notes or whatever? Yeah. So the most important thing with the speech is knowing the audience you're speaking to. Okay. and knowing the result they want to get through the speech. So every audience is going to be a different audience. So when you can really have an idea, like what are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their desires? What are they afraid of? What don't they want to take action on? Right. What are they missing? Yeah. Okay. And then, and, but, and as you described that, I thought to myself, okay, that's sort of the, the basis for, you know, how you, talk about training people too right you like you get you know you kind of start with the end in mind and then figure out the message that's needed in order for us to make the progress to the end yes when you um so you became a really good wrestler in in college um i don't i don't and then you went so i'm wondering the uh you took the path to I just call it MMA because there's so many different things out there that I, but UFC, MMA, but I, I wondered why, um, not professional wrestling or did you try professional wrestling as well? It's cause I think about wrestling. It's such a demanding sport and it's so, uh, amazing. Yeah. And then you get done with it and it's like, Oh, what are my avenues for this ex exceptional skill set that I have? Right. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's kind of like, and maybe there are more that I'm just not aware of, but what was, what were you, what was going on in your mind at the time? So the interesting thing uh, with the wrestling process, there really isn't a professional wrestling. I mean, there is, but that's not uh, real not, wrestling. That's more like televised. Kind of yeah. Wrestling, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they do have uh, Olympic wrestling mm -hmm. and that's, that's like the best of the best, super, super high caliber. This is all I'm doing type wrestling. And so Olympics wasn't something that really interests me personally. And I, I kind of used wrestling as a, as a springboard to finish what I really wanted to do, which was coach people as a personal trainer. Right. So I actually got into personal training uh, after graduating ASU because that, that was my focus at the time. It wasn't to be a high level wrestler. The wrestling just kind of, it was something I liked doing. I enjoyed it, but I wasn't like, I'm going all in on this wrestling thing. Uh, I was actually going to quit the team, but ironically enough, the coach, Coach Ortiz, ended up giving me a scholarship to stay on the team. And so from there, I'm like, well, I can't pass that up. <laughs> sure. Yeah, because you, you ended up getting your degree in um, kinesiology as, as mm -hmm. well, correct? Yeah. Um, and so for people who don't know what that means, because it's a very fancy word, and I think a lot of people may not know exactly what it means. How do you describe it? What yeah, it so it's the study of movement, the science of the study of movement. Oh, uh, was it really interesting? Not only did it focus on like the biomechanics and the understanding of the body, but there was some uh, psychology in there too. And that's something that really, really fascinated me in my journey, the way we think and how we think and the perspectives we use can be absolutely game changers on the uh, journey that we're partaking on. So let's let let me 
let me ask you one question, then I want to get into the psychology, if you don't mind. So mm-hmm. when you talked, talked about, about winning, winning. Um, you know, wanting to win and wanting to be a good winner and a good uh, loser, I guess, or good when you when you don't win. I'm I'm just curious of your opinion since you've been, you know, at the, you know, in, you, you're a professional, professional athlete, and I and so much of professional athletics, it seems now, is really, um, really, really hardcore self promotional, and it's sort of taking the, it's sort of putting the other players down. You know, like you see, whether it's in in fighting. You know, there's always sort of a lot of trash talking and stuff. And then in football or basketball, there's a lot of, you know, fist, you know, chest pounding and stuff. How how do you feel? Like, what's your approach? And what do you think is, is there a right approach? And, you know, or is there, is it, how do you, what, what's your basic feeling about how things should be in sports? So... The approach is the approach you need to use to sleep at night. So ultimately, every action has some sort of reaction or consequence to it. And the question is, okay, why are you doing the thing that you're doing? And what are you looking to obtain with the thing that you're doing? There's a variety of reasons to people's whys. And so they get to choose what they're going to choose and uh, hopefully the best of consciousness and faith. But if a person wants to act out and act wild, that's on them. It's, it's not my place to tell them to act any differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, The, the game that I play personally is is one of uh, doing my best to have honor and respect. And there is a form of gamesmanship in the game as well. You know, like we are there not only to perform, but to entertain because people watch what they they are entertained by. Right. It just it's a fact of life. And so we can we can pout and say, well, they're not as good or they don't do this. But eyeballs are part of the game. It's part of the name of the game. OK, so there has to be something more than the athleticism is what you're saying. But you can. You, you choose th- you choose that with the with sort of the the matrix that it's important for the, the fans and it's infor- important for your status I guess but also you have to sleep at night with with whomever you decide to be yeah but, yeah okay all right so let's let's move on to psychology then um, you um, you, t- you know you're coaching you first of all I love the transformational part of it like I, lo- I, I I really do enjoy people who describe themselves as transformational agents or transformational coaches and um, one of my favorite books was um, David Goggins book I don't, um, you can't hurt me I think is what it was called have you read that book or are you familiar with him yeah I'm familiar with him okay well I, I just remember I don't re- I don't remember everything out of the book but I remember this sort of governor on your mind concept that he brought up and that you know, basically, in his opinion, you know, we use about 40% of our actual capacity to achieve things. And he, and he just says, you know, like, if you just imagine if you use the other 60%, what you could accomplish that right now you feel like, or you talk yourself out of um, not being able to do. So let, so I, so let's get, you know, first of all, a high level, I guess, f- with you and how you feel about how important psychology is and how you use it in your for yourself and how you use it for your your clients and and for anybody else that you interact with. Uh, it's an absolute game changer, cause because everything starts with a a belief, you know, a, a belief in self. If we believe we can do something, the probability of that thing increases. And so when I start with working with an individual, for instance, the power of six, I focus on clarity, confidence, and commitment. Because if they're clear in what their objective is, and they can see their North Star, it can help them become committed to that thing. Just the fact that they can see it, that means they can move towards it. 
and if they can move towards it, commitments is, it can start with big commitments or it can start with inch by inch commitments. You know, like what, how are you going to maintain commitment to the process? And if you say, I'm going to sign my life away and I'm going to do this no matter what, that's one way of doing it. But there's also many commitments that you can do little commitments one by one and use that momentum to keep you moving forward. And that's all the mind piece right there is just to say, are you going to look internally and understand you're where you're at because of you, which is a good thing because that means you can get out of where you're at because of you too. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think of that as, and tell me if this resonates with you. I like to think about that as, you know, when you get yourself to a spot that you don't like, for example, whatever it is, and you think, why am I here? And you ask all these questions about that are outward. You know, they, they aren't introspective. They're, you know, they're outward. And, and when you, and no one answers those questions because there, there's no answer for that. No one's, you know, it, you, you may be looking for someone to blame or, or, or whatever, but they're not out there. They're not answering those questions. But when you look at yourself and you go, you know what? Um, the reality is I designed a system that got me here. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I can accept that as a fact, then I can also accept the fact that I can design a system to get me somewhere else where I, you know, some other place where I want to be. Is that, does that resonate with you? Is that how you think about it? hundred percent. Yeah. I, I look at, so I call it internal, external, internal, where I'm going to look internally like, okay, who am I? Why am I? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What are my conditionings? And then I go external. What are the external components? How, how, what external components can I fix? What can I not fix? What should I focus on? What shouldn't I focus on? What's going to help me move forward? And then I go internally again. Okay, now that I've processed everything, what's my next best action for the person that I am today to move into the direction and the person I want to be tomorrow? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Internal, external, internal. And how, how do you, let's talk about mindset a little bit and belief because when you it's hard enough sometimes to well first of all let me ask you a question do you believe that that's that mindset is something you're born with or something that can be developed whatever your particular mindset might be oh developed all day long, <laughs> developed all day long. okay so yeah. you would also so you would also agree that belief systems can be developed as well absolutely and when the the majority of the people that you end up working with, do they come to you? Do you find that they come to you with a limiting mindset or belief system? Or do you think they or Yeah, I mean, I, how do they arrive? And then what how do you assess where they are? And yeah, I'm just curious how you put all the, you know, the mind body, everything together when you when you start working with somebody because it fascinates me. So we all come to any table with limits. Yeah. Other people just wear their mask better than others. Because if a person really thinks like I have no limiting beliefs, they're BSing themselves. <laughs> yeah. So the first the first step, uh, well, it may not be the first step in the process, but you have to be you have to be real with yourself and aware and aware and accepting in order to. Yeah, I, I, I uh, have a process where I call it self-acceptance, self-awareness, self-transformation. Self-acceptance first, because it's important to just fully accept it. Because if you don't, your ego is gonna find a way to not let you see that thing right, yeah. <laughs> every time. Right, like not, like not having the two mirrors. <laughs> yeah, you... it's gonna be like, what are you, you're good, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> And you, and how often do you, so here's the thing, like coming to see someone like you, who's, you know, accomplished so much and it's easy to, it's easy to only see you as you are now, or as you were as a, you know, in your, as a professional fighter, um, and not see the, the teenager and not see the kid that was, 
you know, four uh, that you described at four or five and six and people come to you and they, you know, it's kind of like meeting a, s a, s a celebrity, right? And you say to yourself, well, h how am I ever going to, how am I ever going to sort of, you know, live up to Cliff's expectations of me? It's kind of a little scary. Like, look at the guy. So how do you, well, I mean, you ha I'm assuming that that happens and how do you diffuse how do you make people comfortable and how do you make people feel like, hey, it's not about measuring, you know, you against me or anybody else. It's about you measuring you against where you want to go and how you're capable of getting there. Listen to them. Listen. Just listen closely. Ask questions. When you can ask the right questions, you can have an idea of why they are not being the celebrity in their own life, because the truth is they really are. And in terms of masks that, that people are wearing, is there like I've heard I've heard a bunch of different people talk about that. I had a guy on my a guy on my podcast, uh, Mike Brody. What uh, Mike Brody Wait is his name, and he actually wrote a book about masks, and it was really cool to hear him talk about it. Talk about it because I didn't th I don't I mean I think I thought about it before, but I hadn't really thought about it like he was like he was you know suggesting we do. And I so I think I, I so I ask you like what is a mask that you've worn that wasn't you and what did it take you if 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 you have and what did it take you to you know realize or get the confidence or you know whatever to take it off so i think we're always wearing some layer of mask and um To take it off, you have to first realize that you're wearing it. Right. Like some people may have one on and not even realize that they're wearing it. Um, my my big thing would be transparency. The more transparent I can become about things, the more transparent they become, and then eventually both the masks come off. Mm. So that's what I that's what I really see. And would you do you? Do, do you have a have you or do you have a tendency for being I, I'm going to call it private, not not lack of transparency, but sort of like a, you know, sometimes you just don't want to tell people stuff because you don't think it's important or you don't think it's their business or, you know, whatever. Is that the same or different? Um. So for me, I call it the dance of transparency, and this is why. Mm -hmm there's levels of reality you should be going into. I will say I'm, I'm a very courageous individual, but courage comes with practice. So anyone can become a very courageous individual. It's just, are they willing to practice it? And how are they willing to practice it? And who is the mentor, the coach or solution or process that can help them practice it? And with the dance of transparency, there's also a respect to the dance of transparency. Like if I started asking you really, really personal questions, right? And I just didn't know you at that level to do it. And I say, what? I just want both of our masks to come off. Just yeah, be yeah, like, yeah. My, whoa, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like what the heck? You're going to have a mask what? and a wall. Yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, like, yeah. what is this guy doing? But if you can, if you can understand the subtleties of the dance of transparency and respect the subtleties of that dance, um, both pe people's masks come off in a very magical way. Mm. Cliff, can you describe how courage comes with practice? That was a really interesting thing that you said. Yeah. The reality that we see, right? Like we see through our, our eyes and it's constantly letting us know this is the reality this is the reality this is reality when you touch something and it burns you it's hot don't do that when you do this don't do that when you do now imagine when you do do something though when you get a cup of water well you're conditioned to believe that i can do this when you begin to walk you're conditioned i can do this and so the more things you do the more actions you take the more lessons you learn and the more lessons you learn, the more you learn how to do things. Mm. 
Some people want to avoid the failure altogether, but you are going to fail forward on your journey. It is part of the process because you're learning something new. Okay. So that's, so as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, okay, so basically the courage, the practice that builds courage is really taking steps towards something new. And what keeps a lot of people from taking steps towards something new is that they don't think about it in steps. They think about it as a leap. Uh, and they don't feel like they could ever make that leap, so they don't take the first step. Is it? Or, and there's, there's also a tentative piece too. I had one coach who talks about having perfect practice. You know, there's a difference between practicing and perfect practice. If you're going to practice half ass, you're not going to get the result that you're looking for. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. But when you're practicing with full in intentionality and you're going after it with everything that you got, and you also have a system or a process to help you move forward, then you start becoming that thing. And the, the really cool thing I didn't realize how important support was until I really started re looking back at my journey, but it's one of the most powerful things we can have just a support system to say yeah you can do this. Even when you were bringing up like I could have some form of celebrity status, I just need to let them know that they're the celebrity in their life we're always the celebrity in our own life, we get to choose what we want and choose what we don't. We get to choose to take action and grow and learn, or we can choose to shrink and get small, mm -hmm. or we can maintain. And I don't really think there is a maintain. I think either you're going forward or you're going backwards. Like you get to choose which direction you're going to go in and why you're going to go in that direction. How, okay. And I'm, I, I am very on board with you with that. And I'm, but, but now I'm wondering the, this limiting beliefs, I want to know how you deal with people who, who you know, are experiencing this thing you call the war in, in your head. It, limiting beliefs when they come to see you and they're, because everybody has those from, and, and they come from all sorts of sources. It could be your dad leaving you. It could be, who, who knows, all kinds of stuff. It, it, how do you deal with somebody that you can't break, where you have a lot of difficulty breaking through that cliff? Because I think that's, like you're obviously able to break a lot of people through that. And I think I, I'm interested in like how you do it. How do you, um, cause you have to run into that, right? Where people are like, no, Cliff, I can't do it. I, you know, just, they're just talking themselves out of what you're trying to talk themselves into. Talk mm -hmm. them into. Yeah. It's interesting. So when you allow a person to speak on whatever they're speaking on, their failures, their successes, uh, their learning experiences, their doubts, their fears. And then you just place options in front of them. Because the truth is, everything comes down to, okay, if I practice something enough in the right way, I'll become the thing that I'm looking to become. And it, it does start with them knowing the options are available. And so you'll hear it and people will give you so many signs, especially the longer you do it as a coach, like you're just going to hear sign after sign after sign after sign and realize, oh, well, that's why they're stuck in the place that they're stuck. And then it's just like my that mirror was my coach when I first started my weight loss journey. That mirror was my coach. It made me look at reality. And I said, I don't want that reality anymore. And so what a coach really does is a good job at placing a mirror in front of you and asking you, hey, is this what you want in your reality? Hmm. I like how you talked about, that's great, by the way. And I like how you talked about the options too, because that's where the psychology comes in, right? Someone's got a limiting belief and they don't want to do it the way that sort of maybe you first suggest they they do it right and so then it's like okay um 
but you want the result, right? You want the end result. That's what you told me. Yes, I do want the end result. Okay, so you don't want to do it this way. No, I don't think I can do it this way. Okay, so then, you, then it's all about, well, how can I develop an option that I can offer them that they will then say yes to? And we can start making the step and just, they don't may not even realize it, right? Is that the subtlety? I, I, that seems like the psychology of it. Yeah, it's really, it's kind of simple because it's momentum just like anything else. Yeah. Uh, so when we learn how to use momentum effectively, we can't be stopped. Now, if we use it ineffectively, we can't be stopped in the wrong direction. <laughs> so it really depends how we're using this momentum. Right. And so even if a person's mood, like I've seen people basically, it, I call it running the car backwards. They have their car in reverse going as fast as it can, the wrong direction. So first we just got to get that to stop and not come to a screeching halt. We don't want to mess the mind up and, and turn it into something that is not good for them in the long run, mm -hmm. but we want to get it like, okay, so you can go a little bit slower. All right, a little bit slower. Okay, we can stop. All right, let's check the car. Let's check the engine. Let's check the tires. Let's make sure we didn't mess anything up too bad. And now we can slowly start inching the other direction. And then eventually we'll put, we'll, uh, put our foot on the gas and we'll accelerate and we'll fly and we'll create the dream and the reality that we want to create. Okay. Yeah. So first, before we can move forward, let's stop the behaviors that are, you know, moving us backward, right? Let's acknowledge what they are. Let's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask about a personal, um, you know, courage takes practice story for you. And I'm, I'm assuming this is going to be one. And if it's not, you just tell me, mm -hmm. move on. Um, when you decided that you wanted to be become a fighter, uh, you had been a wrestler, as we talked about, and so you hadn't um, done any boxing or you hadn't done any, you know, had had a lot of the skill sets that you need to be, um, you know, uh, an MMA fighter. And and I, I think I also read where you, you said that your coach said, you know, you had a goal and your coach said, you can't, you're not going to be able to achieve that that goal probably for good reason, because your coach probably knew all these other things that you would have to know to become competitive, right? right? To be yeah. a fierce competitor. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering how you, because boxing is a key part of, of it's just key skill set. Right? If you, you, you have to know how to box in order to be good. I think the way, the way, of, and, and boxing is not easy. Boxing is, and I know this from my own experience, cause I'm a, I'm been boxing for a couple of years now and it's, it's it's so unlike the movements and all seem to me a, a, a lot not not like movements that I was used to making as an athlete. Of course, that was like a long time ago, but like football movements, footwork and all that is just different. And it gets it's really hard to become a good boxer, even to have a good jab, for example, to to set up other things. And then here you are with I don't think you had much experience that and, and then you needed it to perform you know, not just for working out like I do, but, to, you know, to, to avoid being killed, you know, in the, in the, <laughs> in the ring. So it was that it, it is, could you walk us through that, you know, courage journey on, you know, on your part? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, first fight, you sign a contract, right? Get a date in place and you go to work, you know, you do the thing that you need to do. Uh, you're in your training camp. You're enjoying your training camp. I'll actually use my second fight because my first fight was, was kind of a walk in the park. And that was only that was an experience thing on both ends. Uh, but my second fight was a completely different fight. So I'll use that one. Okay. Uh, so you sign your contract. You're going through your process. You're going through your journey. You're training yourself to be prepared for this fight. And then uh, fight time comes. The ref talks to you in the back, in the back of the room. You start getting a little bit nervous because you know it's getting realer. <laughs> it's it's realer than it was before. When you're in training camp, you can move, you can get those jitters out, you can do it. You're you're taking action. So taking action, action is actually very comfortable for us. For people to take some sort of action, it's actually one of the most comfortable things that we do. 
it's taking different action that is scary. And so you don't go to fight every day, not like the fight that you're about to have and not trying to knock somebody out. So you feel it and you get nervous and you know you got to calm yourself down because the fight is happening in your head and it's probably not going great. Like you're probably freaking yourself out pretty good. So you do whatever you can to maintain your composure. Mine personally was listening to music. Music really helped me in that process. So I listen to music. I do a little bit of shadow boxing. I move around. I speak with my coaches. Uh, we get the game plan ready to go. And then you get your hands taped and then it gets even realer because now you know like, oh my, now you can't back out. You're getting your hands taped. It's just like, this is even more real than the signing of the contract. I'm really committed in this thing. Uh, and you put your gloves on and in your head, you're like, what in the hell is wrong with me? Like, why am I getting ready to do this? This is uncomfortable. I'm feeling nervous. Then they finally call your name and you start walking towards walking towards the arena. And it gets loud because you can hear the crowd cheering or booing, hopefully cheering. <laughs> hopefully you're not that one unless you like to be. And you're going through the process and you're going inside of this cage and they close the cage on you. And you're like, wow, this is about to get extremely, extremely real. Yeah. And you're looking across from your component. Across, yeah. You're looking across yeah. at somebody who looks extremely, extremely real. <laughs> yes. Yes. You're looking, you're looking across at your component opponent and uh, the ref says, are you ready? And then says the other guy, are you ready? Let's get it on. And everything just goes into really narrow focus about the opponent that you are me you are meeting in the center of the cage. You are ready to see anything and everything that is coming your way. And they're probably ready to see anything and everything that is coming their way as well. Mm -hmm. And you get to see who the best person is that day. And my second fight was there's levels to this courage game because the fight wasn't going my way. Uh, the guy was kicking the crap out of my leg and it really hurt. <laughs> like getting, <laughs> getting hit with, with a shin by a Muay Thai fighter is not the most fun position to be in. And when it's happening repeatedly, it really isn't the most fun position to be in. And I got the chance to see who I was. Was I gonna buckle mm. and just give up because it wasn't going my way? Or was I gonna show up and give my best and see what happened? And so what I did was I showed up, I gave my very best and somehow I pulled it out. I ended up winning that fight and I couldn't walk for two weeks, but I won. Mm. And having that on my belt was to say, you can go through hellacious moments and come out on top. And it wouldn't have mattered if I came out on top or not, because I know I gave my all. And, and that's the most important piece. And I learned a lot from that fight. And even then, even when your mind was, you know, your body was probably telling your brain, hey, we should get away from this because it hurt you know, yeah. a lot. And so your mind... Uh, your mind goes into protection mode, right? But you have to go, you have to override it, I guess, and say, no, it doesn't hurt that much. And, you know, look what I'm doing to, to him you know, or something. I don't Yeah. Well, for, for me, it was more of the internal of who are you going to be yeah. when you have to look in the mirror. It constantly comes back to the mirror for me. I want to be proud at what I look at in the mirror. You know, the first time I got that that real deep glimpse of myself and who I was. Now I realize, like, holy crap. Well, now I get to look at this person in the mirror every day right. and say, am I proud of this person? Am I proud of what they've done? Am I excited for their accomplishments? Or do I need to make some changes? Do I need to make some adjustments? So in my fights, every fight I've been super proud of. 
uh, win or lose, because I haven't won them all. Mm -hmm. But um, I came out and I gave my best and I learned lessons along the way. And I got, we call it the critter brain or the reptilian brain or whatever you want to call it. When we can be strong, regardless of what that brain is doing, that's when we're winning, you know, because that happens inside of the arena and outside of the arena. You're going to have to use that in your marriage <laughs> with kids, with family, <laughs> right. with bosses, with people you work with, with partners, with teammates, with everything. Hmm. What? Thanks for sharing that. What does your family look like now? Uh, the family dynamic is me, my wife, and my two little kids. Uh, one is five. The other one's about 11 months now. Oh. And uh, me and my wife have been married for 14 years. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, two questions, uh, at least two questions for you, and then we're, we'll, we'll be done. First of all, I, I think I saw in your bio that um, choosing to uh, fight, like, you know, MMA fight is the hardest thing that you've ever chosen intentionally to do. And it made me think, that's an interesting way to put it. So I thought I'd ask you, what's the hardest thing that you've had to to fight unintentionally? So um, I had a family member pass away and it, it was pretty devastating. And there were a piece of it even when it's not your fault, there's a piece of you that takes responsibility for it, especially when you're a person who knows the importance of taking responsibility. Okay. So you really hold on to that and you gotta, you gotta fight those demons of, you can't be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we wanna do it so right and we wanna make no mistakes and sometimes we look back at things and go, if I could have, should have, would have. And it doesn't happen that way. And then sometimes you learn even more. You know, you learn more of, of the story. And you look at the story completely different. Mm -hmm. and you have to fight those demons as well. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for sharing that. Um, when you're working with people now, Cliff, what is the, what is for you what is and i know you you you're gonna flip this on me and say what's important is what it's in for them but for you what's what is your victory when you're you know when you're working with entrepreneurs and executives through your transformational coaching what how do you know when you're winning were we in this together mm -hmm. Was I the person that helped them through their process? You know, I, I sometimes think uh, of my situation when I was younger and people are going to come in and out of our lives. And there's a saying, uh, blood is thicker than water. Right. right. And it, it's, uh, I actually looked at that quote differently because I, I've heard it a couple of different ways. I didn't realize how powerful it was for me, but a lot of people were given the impression blood is thicker than water means uh, your family is deeper rooted than people who are outside of the family. And um, there was a scholar who explained it's the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, meaning the blood, sweat, and tears that you take on with somebody is deeper than the person who has birthed you. And so in my life, I feel like I've really done right by my clients when they know I did the best that I could and I did it with full integrity, regardless of what the outcome is going to be. The outcome's important. It's important. But you have to you have to go out there and see what happens. Just like a fight, 
I can't tell my coach you screwed up because you know, the coach just gets you ready for everything you need to get ready for. Right. right. But you have to step into your arena and then you get to see, am, am I going to show up or am I not? Or are things even going to work out my way? Sometimes that the fighter is just a better fighter that day. So you, you just have to know you and your coach went out and did everything you could uncover every rock that was possible. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the blood of the womb. That, that is, um, I was not expecting that to be part of the answer. That is fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. That is, that is fantastic. So Clifford, um, how do people get a hold of you or reach out to you? What, what do you want people to do? Yeah. So ultimately I'm really focused on building my Facebook group and it's called the MBB mastery and MBB stands for mind body business. It's a private group. So if you're an entrepreneur and you have a big dream and you're looking to turn that big dream, cause I'm not looking for small dreams. <laughs> I'm looking for big dreams. If you're looking to turn a big dream into a reality, uh, come on in, you know, you're, more than welcome and i i like to see what we can create and see how we can make those those dream solutions like see how we can make them a reality okay the the mbb yeah facebook what is it the mbb mbb mastery, mastery. yeah MBB mastery. So i may even be calling it mbb community eventually i haven't decided yet but yeah it stands for mind body business because it's about getting all three right. Okay. And you've got your, your website is your name. Yeah. Right? Clifford. Clifford, Clifford And um, thank you. This has yeah. been an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed uh, this and getting to know you and learning about you and sharing these. You've got so many wonderful words that you shared that, you know, practice of cur you know, courage, you practice. And that last one, really good. That's a really good stuff. It's been an honor to get to get to know you, Cliff. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. I thank your audience as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How Did Happen podcast, where we believe that success doesn't happen unless you make it happen. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And while you're there, please rate it and leave a comment as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, ideas for future guests, or whatever you'd like to share. And of course, you can always find me at MikeMalatesta.com. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to the How Did Happen podcast.